But I do want to welcome all of our uh, first-time guests and returning guests. It's so much fun to see new families coming into the church house here, and we get to meet them, we get to know them. So I say welcome to you guys. Church family, can you welcome our guests here this morning? And like I shared last week, we have people watching online all over the place, not just here in Phillips, but all over the world. And it's so much fun to see messages and emails that I get throughout the weeks, you know, encouraging me for prayer requests, whatever it is. They just let me know that they're watching, they're enjoying it. So our church is not just founded in Phillips, okay? We're going to be all over the globe. So can we welcome our online family as well? Amen. And of course, I do not want to miss an opportunity to welcome um, the absolute reason why we've gathered, and his name is Jesus Christ. Can we welcome the King of Kings this morning? Today's message is entitled, God is Wanting to Do a New Thing. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Mark, um, the second chapter. Uh, so Mark's Gospel is the second um, book of the New Testament. So if you uh, are fairly new to the Christian walk, we welcome you. Uh, and I want to encourage you to begin reading the Bible. And if you want to begin in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the four Gospels. It's a wonderful place to start if you're just now getting into it. And even the seasoned veterans, it's good to go back and reread uh, the things that God has done. Because the Gospels just depict the story of Jesus Christ. It gives us the reason why He was brought here on earth gives us a storyline of uh, how he lived his life, the miracles, the ministry that he had, the, the, the death and resurrection, and the purpose behind that. So anybody that has a moment, man, I would just get into the Gospels of, uh, of the Bible and just be blessed for that abundantly. Um, so it, it is so much fun to uh, just dissect the Word. Uh, I know that our Wednesday night Bible study, we have such a good time on Wednesday night, don't we, church? Um, just... Step by step, just tearing the Bible apart, saying, okay, God, what are you saying to me in this verse? Or this syllable even. You know, we just break it down to the lowest detail so we can just glean the most information from that. And it's so much fun to do that, so I encourage you to do that on your own time. So we're going to be going to Mark chapter 2, looking directly at verse 18 through 22. So if you have your Bibles there, shout out amen. 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 So I'm, we're going to do something different. We've done that all day long already. So we're going to continue to do that pattern. I'm going to ask you to stand in honor to the word as we read it together. And just ask God to bless this time together. Because you know what? Without his blessing upon this, it's just a speech. It's just a gathering. And I'm not, I don't want that. I want to know that I've been in the presence of God. How about you guys? So let's begin reading in verse 18. Now John's, disciple, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people asked, uh, asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Verse 19. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. Verse 21. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to use this time before you. Just to bless this church, God, I pray, Lord, you speak directly through me. Lord, I completely get myself out of the equation, Lord, I am just your speaker. So, Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord, for the testimonies that we've already received. And I ask you, God, to transform us now and forever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. So Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, had a two-part ministry going on during this part of the Bible. You know, John's uh, ministry, this first and foremost part of his ministry, was to present uh, the, the, word of Christ, the Word of God to people in a way that it convicted them. So they brought, he brought them into a place of repentance. He says, you, you've sinned. You've, you've sinned against the body of God, or the, the, the Word of God, because Christ really wasn't preached yet. 
So he's trying to preach to them right now to say, you know what, you need to repent. You need to change your ways. And the second side of John's ministry was to be a forerunner for Christ, preparing the way for Jesus Christ here on the earth. So this two-part ministry, you may not believe it or not, wasn't well received with the people that were walking contrary to God's will. I know that it may be weird to you, but some people don't like people calling you out their problems and mistakes. I don't know if you know anybody like that. Don't look at your wife or husband. That's not right. Okay. But sometimes we get convicted by doing things that are contrary to the word of God and the will of God. And this was John's, um, that was his ministry. So you can see that he may not have had too many friends. You know, it might have been his disheveled look. You know, it might have been the locust stuck in his beard right next to the honey. You know, it probably wasn't the, the greatest appearance. But he still did the will of God no matter what he was doing. And I'm thankful for John and the work that he did. And it ultimately cost him his life. But you know, he was so grateful to be used by God in this manner. So God was doing a new thing right there in John's life. He wasn't just doing the old thing. He did a new thing in John. It wasn't just because he was his cousin, Jesus' cousin. It had nothing to do with that kind of relationship. God chose him because he knew he was going to be obedient. See, church, God's not looking for a church that was, um, had the right bloodline. It wasn't looking for the church that had the right last name or the right credentials. See, God wants to use an obedient church to further the kingdom of God. So it could be you today. So don't count yourself out right now thinking, you know what? I haven't been doing this long enough to be able to make a difference for the kingdom. That's a lie from hell. God used a wretch like me to come to Phillips to present a gospel and transform a community. It has nothing to do with Jason except for my obedience. It's the power of God in me. So all credit and all glory goes back to God. And I'm no different than you guys. No different. That God, what God's done through me and around me, He wants to do the same thing through you. And see, God's not happy with doing the same old, same old. He gets bored with that kind of stuff. Now, he'll re he refer back to it. That's why we have the Old Testament, you know, to give us an idea of what to expect. Because God doesn't like to surprise us. But He also likes to do a new thing. He likes to keep us on our toes. Like this morning, I, I didn't plan for any of this. I'm kneeling right there in my prayer, in, in, on my chair, and I'm like, okay, God, we're doing that today. That's fine. We have to be ready to do that new thing with God all the time. Not just when we're expecting it, but even when we don't expect it. So I feel the church of 2021 has been called to do the exact same thing as John was called to do. To present the gospel in a way that it convicts the hearts of those that are listening. And prepare for the second coming of Christ. That's our job. And it may not be the easiest job, and it may not be the most... A glamorous job at times. We can see our brothers and sisters in Christ around the globe dying for their faith. But it doesn't mean they're stopping. We're going to go all the stronger. So this morning, as we go through our text, I want you to begin asking yourself, or asking God rather, what is it that you want to do through me that's new? See, I, I enjoy patterns. You know, I'm, I'm a, kind of a, I like different things in my life to be consistent. But I really love having new things from God. I mean, it just blows my mind. Like, wow, even reading this text, and I'll get to the point in just a moment that I stood up in my office, I'm like, wow, that's really in there, you know? Because God is still doing something new in me, the same as He is with you guys. If we skip down to verses uh, 21 and 22, this is where I want to spend the majority of our time today. It's talking about doing things new. Jesus was trying to explain to these Pharisees that some things in their lives have to change. Now, some of the stuff they're doing was fine. Prayer, fasting, that kind of stuff. As long as the fasting, and that's the reason why they were talking about fasting, was to bring glory to God. But see, the Pharisees, see, Jesus doesn't look at the outward stuff. He doesn't just look at what other people see. He looks at the conditions of your heart. So when it came to fasting, Jesus is like, that needs to change too. Because these Pharisees were fasting two times a week, all right? But they did so so they can stand up on their pedestal and say, I fasted, y'all. Look at me. And Jesus says, get off your soapbox. It's not about you. You're supposed to be doing things in the closet. So other people don't have to say, oh, good job, so-and-so. The glory goes back to God. 
So as Jesus was proclaiming what, what truth truly was to these Pharisees, you can just imagine the thoughts going through their mind going, this changes everything. And you're right. The blood of Jesus changes everything. The power of God changes everything. You can't keep, continue going through your life the way you were when you're introduced to the man named Jesus. Everything about your life changes if you allow him to. Back to more of that in a moment, though. <laughs> As we go through this, this paragraph here about the old wineskins and the new wineskins and new wine and all that kind of stuff. See, I love how Jesus uses everyday items to preach and bring truth and revelation to their life. Like these men that were gathered around him this day, they understood what wineskins were, how they operated, what you had to do. But today, Jesus isn't just talking about a goat skin stretched out and sewn together for some wine. He's talking about our lives. When he begins to talk about these wineskins, he wasn't talking about a sack full of wine. The wineskins represented our life. And when Jesus started talking about these old wineskins, they understood what, they, what he was talking about. As I sat in my office this week, I began to ask God, show me, God, what do these wineskins, these old wineskins, represent in the body of Christ? The answer that he gave me was not a pretty one. Ooh, that'd be me. I'll just stand still. I'll edit that out. So these wineskins that are dry, cracked, damaged, is our life. See, a dry wineskin is unusable by God. The cracks and crevices that are inside these wineskins will allow... God just to leak all over the floor because he wants to do something new in you but the old dryness of our life doesn't allow it to take place see when you see something that's like a dried wine skin it becomes rigid unpliable unusable it doesn't expand it doesn't go with the flow it just continues to stay say this is what I'm going to be forever and I find so much time in our churches that says God did this in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and that's the only way God moves in a church is by this, because we're comfortable with this. I have nothing wrong with hymns, but there's, there's a God out there that likes more than just hymns. Because you think about it, I've been into some crazy youth services where, I mean, they were bumping some music that none of you guys even heard of or would appreciate, but the Holy Ghost swept across that congregation the same as he would if we're singing Amazing Grace, because God was, inhabits the praises of his people. God wants you to sing a new song once in a while. Maybe dance a new jig once in a while. Get outside your comfort zone. Say, you know what, God, I still want to be pliable. I want to be useful. I want to be used by you for that new thing. But religion slips in and makes us rigid. Legalism can destroy a church. And I'm so thankful that we are not legalistic at this church. Some of you guys were surprised I found a coat and tie today, which is great. I promise I'll have clothes on every Sunday, but it may not look like this. It may be just a t-shirt and a pair of jeans one day, because you know what? God is not impressed by the way I look. God looks at my condition of my heart. Because here's the thing, I don't want anybody in the outside world that comes in here go, I won't fit in that church because all, I don't have a suit and tie. I don't have a fancy dress. All I have is cut off blue jeans and flip flops. Come on in. Come on in. That legalistic man mindset will destroy the movement of God because we think God only operates in the rigidness, in the order. God doesn't. He took some chaos in my life and says, you know what? I'm going to do something radical for you. Thank you. Going to. 
Now, verse 21, Jesus talks about sewing a patch on an old wineskin. You don't put a patch on nothing. You put a patch on a hole. Damage. A crack. A crevice. That's what you put a patch over. And in some of your lives right now, you have a hole. You have damage to your life. That God wants to heal. But sometimes these cracks and crevices are so major in our life that God says, you know what? I can't just put a patch over this. It's not going to hold on to it. You're too far gone. So what I'm going to do is a new thing. I'm going to give you a whole new life. So don't look at your circumstances. Don't look at your past. Don't look at the damage that the enemy is allowed to be upon you and say, now I'm not usable by God because of this past. God says, I'll make everything new. As I began to tear, look into this, uh, this passage even further, you know, it says the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear, underline the word tear in your Bible if you haven't done so already, Making the tear worse. And as I dug into that word tear, I went to my uh, my new uh, keyword study Bible. I love that thing, by the way. I I got all the way down to the Greek meaning of the word tear. And when it talks about tear there, in that particular instance, it says a division among people. A tearing away means two people being torn apart. There's tears going on within our body here. People are trying to fight against different people, and now a lot of it has subsided over the years. We've prayed a lot of the Spirit out of here. But that Spirit of Jezebel does not go away quietly. That Spirit of Jezebel would love to come up, make noise, cause confusion, there's dissension between people, undermine me, undermine the, the authority of this church, undermine the authority of God. I'm telling you right now, Jesse needs to die. We're going to keep stomping on her head until she decides to leave once and for all. See, there's no place for discord among believers. God's calling us to a spirit of unity. Now, unity doesn't mean we're going to see eye to eye on every single thing, because you know what? The Cardinals are still number one. Get over it if you, if you like the Brewers. It's okay. But we can still be brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Maybe you're a Dodgers fan. I don't know. You know, just throwing that out there. Some things that we fight about are nonsense. Stuff that God's like, what? Knock it off. It doesn't matter. This book is what matters. The salvation of the saints. The gathering together. That's pretty cool. How to get to heaven. You know, the longer I've shared this with you many times, the longer I spend with my brothers in Christ that go to different churches, they preach behind different pulpits, there's only one Jesus, one Lord, one Savior, one blood, one, one Bible. So these differences that we talk about, maybe they're man-made. Maybe they're demonically made. Maybe God wants us to say, you know what? I love you just the way you are. The same as he did for us. And here's the other thing that God, you probably already know this. There's no pretending To be new wineskins. Like, I can put on a tuxedo next Sunday, which I'm not. And you're not going to go, is that a new pastor? No. It's still Jason, okay? Like like Scooby-Doo. Ta-da! You know. It's the same person. See, God doesn't look at my outer appearance and go, oh, look, he's a new Christian. No, no, no. He looks at my heart. And the wineskins that we're talking about here is not our outer shell. We can fool one another real easy. Real easy. But God's not even thinking about you trying to fool him. He's not going to be, it's not, it's not, you're not able to. It's foolishness. Verse 22 it says, No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins. And check this out. And both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. This is a very interesting part of this passage here. Because both the wine skin and the wine will be ruined. What does that mean to us? See, if God poured that new wine into your old life, you can't contain it. 
Because the cracks and crevices, let me back up just a little bit. So if you did this in the literal sense of it, if you poured new wine into old wineskins, it expands. It gets bigger. It does new things, right? And if God did that new thing inside of you, it begins to expand, which means it's going to expose all the little dots of, of holes and make them to great crevices. It's going to expose everything in your life and it's going to destroy you. See, God doesn't want to destroy you. He's not into it to destroy you. He wants to convict you. He wants you to, to, to re be replaced and renewed. Regenerated is what the Bible says. But He doesn't want to destroy us. But He also knows what we're capable of doing. So He wants to restore us. And that wine that He's pouring into, him, into us, that new wine, and that can be a new season. It can be all kinds of new stuff. I mean, we'll get to the new in just a moment. But we can't contain the new in our old. We have to submit it over to God and say, you know what? I want new everything. That was kind of the bad news that old skin doesn't hold it. That's the bad news. But Revelation 21.5 says, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Everything. See, God doesn't just leave us in our bad states. And I am so thankful for that. Because I was a mess. My marriage, my finances, job, family. The list goes on and on about the mess that I created. And when I finally submitted everything over to God, he made everything new new as i'll sit in my office just imagining okay god what does this truly look like show it to me in layman's terms because i'm a simple guy what god showed me was a caterpillar you know a little caterpillar not the most beautiful of creatures creepy furry but these caterpillars go upon their life looking like a caterpillar until the day everything changes and he stops crawling and he sits still and he becomes encapsulated with God's love and he emerges later on a brand new creation. And what the craziest thing about it is you can put the caterpillar and the butterfly together side by side and you would not recognize one came from another. In your life today, I want you to hear me church, in your life today, God wants to take you out of where you're at and make something so brand new in you that you won't recognize your new life from your old life. God wants to do that for every single person. If you allow Him to. But see, the caterpillar has to stop moving. You can't go into the cocoon while you're still moving along. You can't stop and have that transformation if you're still running full throttle on your own. See, God wants to do something new in you, but you're too busy moving. Stand still. Be still before the Lord and say, God, I want that new. Whatever you have to do, and let's let him encapsulate you with his love and transform you. Look again at that, first, at that final sentence there in your text. It says, they will pour new wine into new wine skins. <laughs> new. And again, I went back to my study Bible because I love that thing. The different words that came along with this word new, and maybe you already know this. These are what the Greek words are associated with this here. God says, I want to make something fresh in you. Not stale. Youthful was the other word that I underlined in my Bible. Youthful. I like that. Because I got out of breath tying my shoes. So youthfulness is great. Watching those kids play football the other night, that was good to watch. I ain't doing it. But you know what? If the power of God hit me, who knows? Maybe I'll be the quarterback again, I don't know. I don't know if I'll be a running back, I don't have that much faith. Work on it, work on it, alright. And many times in our lives that we feel, and this is just me testifying about myself here, we feel that we are too far gone for the new thing. I have. I felt that way. I'm like, oh man, I wasted so much time. No. See, as long as we have breath in our lungs, God wants to do something new in us. 
there's a purpose for us to still be here. When He's done using us, then we go home to glory. But I look around the room, all y'all's breathing, which means you got some work to do. So ask God, what is it I need to do? And you know what? Sometimes we feel broken down in our bodies, gimped up, whatever. And God says, I want to make everything new. Everything. So if you feel sick in your body, say no. The blood in the, or the body of Christ was broken for my healing. I am healed. And, t- and your spirit just keeps saying it. Now, if your body doesn't catch up right away, it doesn't matter. You keep proclaiming and standing on it. You're healed in Jesus' name. Another word that I underlined in my Bible says regenerated. I like that. Brand new. Healed up all the parts to make it look like it's never been broken before. How many of you guys got some broken parts that you want God to heal? Amen. Hmm. To get to these parts, and we talked about this last week, I know, we have to go into full surrender mode for God. Pretending and playing games of, you know, everything's okay. God pour in new wine. God's like, no, I ain't doing it. And maybe you feel stagnant right now in your walk with Christ. Maybe you've been praying, God, do a new thing in me. And you're like, why isn't God doing a new thing in me? Maybe he's waiting on you to fully surrender and say, you know what? I want to be a new wine skin so you can do the new wine inside of me. We get in our own way. As God does, does a new thing in us, it doesn't just touch the ministry. And that's the cool part. We think when we come to Christ, it only does the, the salvation thing, you know. But God wants to impact every area of your life. And over the past 18, 19 months, we've had pretty, uh, a scary time in, war, in the world. A lot of fear coming down upon us, right? Worry about this, worry about that. But you know what? Worry is not of God. All it does is add more stress and worry, and then it becomes, gives us uh, ulcers and more sicknesses. I mean, it's medically can be proven that stress will kill you. And Philippians 4, 6 and 7 tells us exactly what to do with stress and worry, doubt and fear. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Check out verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. So talking about this new thing that God wants to do in you, maybe you've been a worry wart. God says, I want to take that away from you. I want you to be brand new in that area too. God wants you to be completely free from all that's holding you back. Who wants a stress-free life? Do you believe that it could actually happen? Now living for Christ... You can be stress-free. Now, you still have things that pop up. You're still going to have bills. So don't call me in two months when your electricity gets cut off. Okay, you still got bills. But God's going to provide for you. God's going to provide every single moment of your life. God's like, I'm going to take care of that. See, this last week, I had to learn that lesson again because I'm really thick-headed sometimes. God's like, quit trying so hard. If you would just submit over to me, I will take care of it. So for three straight days, I'm just scrambling trying to fix a problem in my life. Coming up with solutions and answers and ideas and brainstorming, bouncing ideas off my wife and everything else. And then Thursday morning, I wake up and God gives me the answer that I've been praying for. And I tell Angie, I got it. God says this. And when I know what her answer was, because I love her, she goes, why do you think of that on Monday? I'm like, because I wasn't submitting yet. Don't tell her I told you guys. We'll edit that out of the tape too. God wants to do all things brand new in us. And if we would get out of the way, we, we are our own worst enemy in a lot of cases. Putting our hands where it does not belong. God, I want to do a new thing. How can I help you, God? And God's like, stop helping. You're in the way. Just be fully submitting over to him. The work that God's doing in this church involves you. That's another new thing. Many of you guys have gifts and talents, abilities. 
ministries that I didn't know about. And God's calling you forth saying, you know what? We're doing this new thing together. I need you. He needs you. The people sitting left and right of you need you. That new thing that God wants to do is not just for your benefit. It's for the benefit of the body of Christ, which is absolutely amazing. Because when the body gets together and we all get submitting over under God, we can receive that new wine as a uni- unified body. And the good thing about my life is that God didn't stop halfway through the process. I'm so thankful because that would be a real mess for you guys. For 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I'm sure the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. See, God's going to be faithful to see this thing all the way through the end. He's faithful to complete the work inside of you. I'm so far off my notes, I don't even know where to begin now. But that's all right. This is the part where God gets to take over completely, right? As you completely submit to God, you will recognize things in your life changing that you didn't expect to be touched by God. You know, when I submitted my life over to God, I didn't expect my marriage to take off the way it did. I didn't. It wasn't my purpose. I didn't say, God, I'm going to give you my heart so you can fix my wife and my, my, my marriage. I submitted to God because I wanted more of God. But in turn, every aspect of my life was radically changed by God. Because I had to submit myself. And as God began to pour that new wine into me, it didn't look like the old stuff. My ministry became stronger. My relationship with my children became better. And stronger. Financially, I became wiser. Sometimes bad things happen because we're dumb and we make bad choices. Not always the devil's fault. So God had to instill that upon me saying, you know what? Be better about this. But just remember what I said about the butterfly, man. The butterfly doesn't wake up one morning and tell him, bam, I'm a butterfly. Right? He has to stop and admit where he's at and just let God... Take over. Some of you guys might be afraid of the new life because you're so used to the old life. This goes back to the rigidness that we talked about before. The old life has to go. All the old things that you enjoyed in life that were contrary to the will of God has to go. Bad habits, people, Even family members, you have to limit yourself of these exposures because they're dragging you away from the kingdom of God. And you know what? That's probably one of the hardest things to recognize that, you know what? Sometimes family members are not a good thing in your life. That was a hard one for me. I've talked to Pastor Kelly many times about different family members. I'm like, man, I just have a hard time praying for them just because they make me angry and hurt. He says, you don't have to be around them every day, but you do have to pray for them. You got to love them. I said, okay. So as I began to pull away from them, I began to pour out my love more for them. So God was doing a new thing even in that inside of me. See, some of these new things that God's doing inside of us, this new wine is talking about new ministries. As I look across the globe, the need is so great. So great across the whole world. People who need Christ, they need to hear your testimony, yours. And if we sit silently in the church thinking someone else is going to go, you miss out on the blessing. God will send somebody else, but you miss out on a blessing that will completely rock your world. See, I was really comfortable in Troy. I like Missouri. All my family was there. All my friends were there. Great hunting property. We even had ducks. And God says, I want you to go to Phillips. I had to get a map, find out what that's at. 
So God's going to take you out of a place that maybe you feel comfortable about. Maybe He's going to move you across the country. And you don't know why. But God's going to transform you into what He wants you to be. And He's going to pour into you a new ministry. And here's the thing. I'm tapped out. I can't do too much more throughout the week, time-wise. But as I look across this congregation right now, I see preachers, evangelists, teachers, missionaries, workers, you name it. Each one of you guys have a gift and talent. Every one of you guys do. And to sit down and do nothing for God, that's a, that's, that's a shame. Ask God, what is it that you want to do through me? Because it is so much fun to be used by God every day. It is so much fun to wake up not knowing what your day is going to be like, just knowing you're on for an adventure. It is fun. It literally is fun to be used by God. Is it scary? Absolutely. Not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring is sometimes scary. But it's an adventure. It's like a road trip with no map or GPS. You just go. And God's going to lead you. So don't think that God's going to do the same thing that he did with you last year. Or the year before. Or in your life. Some of you guys may have been Sunday school teachers 10 years ago. That's great. What's God going to do with you now? Maybe God's going to shift you into a whole new ministry. Maybe God's going to catapult you to a whole new church. I don't know. I don't want you to leave in here, but you know what? I'm not going to hold you back either. That's one of the greatest things I can say about my pastor, Kelly. He didn't hold me back one moment. I told him I had to leave. He's like, praise God. God's going to use you. This is not about a VCC. It's not about a denomination. It's not about a building. It's about the body of Christ being used across the globe. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to submit yourself to God 100%. The things that's in your life, give them over to God, every bit of it. Those hurts, those wounds that we talked about, don't live in a broken state. Don't live in a victim mentality. You're not a victim. I want you to say the word. I am not a victim. Say that. The Bible doesn't just call you a conqueror either. He says, I'm more than a conqueror. God has already given you the victory over every single thing in your life. No matter what the difficulty is, no matter what the hardship is, no matter what was spoken over you, God has given you the victory already. So you're not even fighting the battle. It's already won. All you have to do is receive. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet real quick. I'm going to pray over you. God's stirring this morning in your heart. And I don't know what God's saying to each one of you guys individually. I don't. It doesn't really matter what he's saying to you individually, but, but collectively, he says, I'm calling you up to higher places. Higher places. Not where we're at yesterday or last year or 10 years ago. God's calling you up to higher places in him. Now, like I've said a million times today, it's up to you to submit to God and allow him to do that work in you. Let's pray. Father, I ask you right now to do a new work in each one of us. And Lord, the areas that's in our life that need to be replaced with new wineskins, I ask you, God, to transform us and renew us. God, if you have to throw the whole thing away and start over, I'm okay with that with me. And I know many in this congregation feel the exact same way. I ask you, God, to transform us to be more like you. The way we think, the way we li live, the way we love, the way we see the world. Let us see this world through your eyes. And Lord, as we submit over to you, I ask you to pour out your new wine into us. Birth out of us, God, something brand new. Lord, I don't want something that's stale or stagnant. I want something that's alive and moving. So Father, today we call upon your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. and amen.